We welcome you into Doug Kingsmore Stadium tonight here in Clemson, South Carolina. The rain has gone away and we're ready for baseball as the Tigers look to get back on the winning side as they take on Georgia State at home tonight. Well, hi, everybody. Glad to have you with us alongside Tim Bure. I'm William Quackenbush. Tim, these are two teams desperate for a win. It was raining earlier today, but you just had a feeling they were going to find a way to get this game in to give them some good vibes heading into the weekend. Well, I think both coaches will, would have been willing to play this game in a snowstorm uh, because the Tigers have lost six in a row. Georgia State has lost seven in a row. Arguably, they both played against tough schedules. In fact, Georgia State played their first 14 games this year against ranked opponents, both teams looking to get on track uh, offensively. And for sure, and the Tigers, if they're going to get track on track offensively, it's going to be these three guys right here. James Parker, the shortstop. You see the numbers, a couple of home runs. The big power comes from Caden Grice, a 6'6 left-handed hitter. Had one of Clemson's two home runs over the weekend against North Carolina. And then Dylan Brewer uh, had the other home run, driven in 11. These three guys are key for Monty Lee, who wants to see a little bit more production up and down the lineup today for the Tigers. Here's a look at Georgia State's lineup. All right-handed hitters, Tim, with nine guys swinging from that side of the plate against a right-hander for Clemson. A bold strategy uh, for Georgia State, but one that they believe in as uh, Brad Stromdahl, the second-year head coach, tries to jog his offense to life a little bit. And there we see Clemson defensively. Pretty good infield with Parker and Henderson up the middle. The freshman Grice with a lot of length there at first base. Bryce Teodosio in center field, as good as it gets in college baseball out there, with Meredith and Brewer at the corners. Tigers fielding at 973 as a team so far this year. Pretty strong. And Ricky Williams hopes it remains strong. A freshman making his collegiate debut. 6'1, 190. I know a pressure pack. It's not a full stadium. He, not even as full as it could have been with the weather the way that it is, but still some butterflies here as he starts his college career. Yeah, the two pitchers we have going at it today have pitched a combined 10 and a third innings in their collegiate careers coming into today. Well, here's Dalton Pearson. A little bit of rain right now as we start things. It rained for most of the morning and early afternoon and then petered out and had a chance to get the field ready. And now we're hopeful that the rain will let up soon. And the first pitch is taken for a strike and we're underway. 6.02 the first pitch time as Pearson, the 283 hitter, stands in. Good start by Williams, counts 0 and 2. Williams, an in state native. And Pearson hangs around. Pearson, six walks, 12 strikeouts, a 353 on base percentage. One of two guys in the Panthers lineup here today that have got three steals on the season. He started every game so far this year. You know, Georgia State's coaching staff looking for his team to get uh, the bat and the ball a little bit better. They have 177 strikeouts versus just 68 walks in 17 games. So doesn't take... Uh, isn't difficult to do the math. It's they're averaging 10 strikeouts a game offensively. I'm gonna get some new baseballs out again. We're we're hopeful the rain's gonna push out. That's why they're okay starting this game, and we may see some mitigating efforts as we see the home plate umpire there, Rusty Griffin, making sure we've got dry baseballs to pitch with. Here's the 2 foul back again. Pearson from Johns Creek, Georgia. 33 of the 41 players on the roster for Georgia State are from the state of Georgia. That ball is a little bit foul wide of first. Count still 0 and 2. This is going to be a recurring theme throughout the game, but the offensive struggles that both these teams have faced, well documented. Look at Georgia State batting just 239. This ball is hit back to right. Tough sky to navigate. Brewer does it for the first out. 
Good start for Ricky Williams there. So he sits down Pearson and Will Mize, who's maybe the best player on this team, stands in. The number is pretty gaudy. Freshman out of Snellville, Georgia. He is batting 371 with a couple of home runs. And he hit 373 last year, so this is no no fluke. We talked to Allison George before the uh, game. She's the baseball SID, and, she, and we asked her who's the best player on this team, and without hesitating, she said Will Mize. Check, and it was in time. Ball one taken. Williams coming with breaking balls that time on the inside corner. You see another look at that. Good pitch on the inner half. They come around the plate a little bit. Normally, when we come to the air like this, we've got a little bit of knowledge to share with you. We are learning a lot about Ricky Williams as you are. <laughs> Many conversations with Monty Lee. Here's a ground ball up the middle. Parker makes the play. And all the conversations with Monty Lee so far this year that we've had, not once has he mentioned Ricky Williams to me. Well, when you've been on the uh, <coughs> bad streak, it's time to shake things <laughs> up, and that's what he's doing. He's giving this young man a shot. So far, so good. Two that's up, correct. Two down, including getting a 371 hitter. Kalen Puckett, the five runs batted in. Yeah. Pop really, on that fastball, 90 miles an hour. Really pounding the strike zone. Yeah. Catches the outside edge. Yeah. Right at the knees. French may have been set up off the plate there, and it didn't matter. Scraped the corner anyway. 0-1 pitch from Williams. Outside corner again. Puckett's got a good eye. He's got nine walks. He's second on the team and walks for Georgia State this year. It's a lineup that's been pretty consistent. A little bit inside. The top four hitters and then the six hitter, Griffin Chaney, have started all 17 games. And they have faced quite a gauntlet. No rest for the weary right now for this baseball team. See if Henderson can make this play on a ground ball. He does. And a 1-2-3 inning defensively to back the freshman, Williams, in his debut. Tigers coming to bat in the bottom of the first when we return in just a moment. Good start defensively for Clemson. Here you look at the Tigers batting order today. Three lefties in the first five, then all right-handed to finish it out. The key here, Adam Hackenberg in the DH spot. We'll say more about him in a second. Defensively, the Panthers out in the field. Pretty good fielding team. Got some good talent. Mize, the aforementioned top dog in the clubhouse, playing at shortstop. The outfield, Smith, Rieselman, and Pearson. And then Marchman is in the game to catch our right-handed starter today for the Panthers, Rafael Acosta, who is no stranger to action, but is making his first start of the season, Tim. Yeah, he's no stranger to playing against good teams. He uh, threw three scoreless innings against second-ranked Vanderbilt, threw two scoreless innings with three strikeouts against second-ranked Florida, and threw a scoreless inning against Kentucky this past weekend. 0 0.87 ERA in his limited action so far. Excited to see him on the mound. You always like a guy who's made some relief appearances, who's done some good work. Mentioned he picked up the decision in that early season win against West Virginia. A guy to get the benefit of having a start under his belt. And both these guys, you mentioned, very little experience on the mound combined, but two guys that have a chance to write a story for themselves in their collegiate careers tonight. Here's Kier Meredith. He's mired in a bit of a slump right now, but a welcome presence in the lineup. 
He's got eight hits on the year. Four of them came against Notre Dame in the first game of that series a couple weeks ago. Takes in ball one there. Over the weekend against North Carolina, Kier was one for 12 in the series. Here's the strike call. You can already tell that the strike zone is going to be a bit expansive for Rusty Griffin tonight. Not a big deal. As long as everybody knows what's up. The ball is mashed through the hole for a base hit. That's a good way to start it off. Meredith, the pest on the bases. We have benefited the track man data in here. 111 miles an hour off the bat. Take a look at this. Yeah, he got around on that. Pitch looked like it was a little bit of a breaking ball and hit it through the hole. Lead off man aboard for Clemson. Now Elijah Henderson stands in. Average is 184, but Elijah has certainly played better lately. I think he started 0 for 14, didn't he? I believe that's correct. Now 7 for his last 24, so that's right around 300. First pitch to him. Inner half, a strike. Acosta, not a super hard thrower. That one came at 88. He may top out about 90. So he'll have to change speeds to keep Clemson off balance here today. He's only walked one guy in 10 innings so far this year. A little bit low there. Good idea to try to attack low in the zone, try to get a double play here. Two pretty good base runners in Henderson and Meredith. Georgia State's very good at turning double plays. Yes, they have they 16 are. this year. I think they're in the top 10 in the country in double plays. Too. Part of being able to turn double plays is keeping runners close. Acosta able to do that with Meredith. Long look in for the sign now. Costa's 1-1. One, one. There's a foul. One and two. Got to through a change up that time. Got to be able to change speeds, no doubt. Yeah, I think that's been the, one of the keys to success. We talk about how he's not a flamethrower, but it is of eight strikeouts in ten innings coming in. See if he can get a punch out here of Henderson. Long look in. And he does get one. Good pitch there with a breaking ball right on the outside edge. First strike out of the day for Acosta. Yep, had a breaking ball right across the corner. Good job by the catcher framing it. And Blaine Marchman, just a freshman himself, out there catching today. A youthful battery. Here's Brewer. Way up and away. We told you in our open, it's one of those guys in the heart of this order. Three, four, five. Brewer, Parker, and Grice that have done almost all the damage for this team in the last handful of ball games when there's been damage done. Up and away there. Of the 20 players starting today's game, 10 for each team, including the DH, uh, each team has four freshmen. So eight of the 20 are freshmen. It feels right, especially with the sort of backlog with last year's players sort of double counting as freshmen. Clemson's put lineups out this year with six or seven freshmen in it, so this is a more of a veteran lineup than we're used to. 3-0 and now the count. 
As I said, he's only walked one guy all year. Well, if he's going to walk anybody in this lineup, it's going to be Brewer. Yeah, you're right. Brewer with uh, 12 walks to lead the team. 12 of Clemson, 60. Fully 20%. Takes a high strike there. He is one of those guys that is absolutely stubborn about the strike zone. I think you see a high strike just above the belt. He's very confident in his, if I didn't swing, it wasn't a strike approach. <laughs> and that time he swung about halfway. Three and two, a good pitch to come back by Acosta. Take another look at this. Yep, he went around. I thought it might have been a called strike anyway. Pretty good pitch there. Let's see what Meredith does on a 3-2 here. With Parker on deck, and I think Acosta is trying to get a cheap pick off that time. You know, they're talking about making some rule changes and they are going to make them in the minor leagues this year one of them is sort of one rule change per level one of the changes is going to be limiting the number of pickoff throws big advantage to the base runner right there meredith got caught flinching just a bit able to get back i don't see how pitchers will be able really to control the run game much at all what they're saying is if you pick off a third time on a base runner at first and you don't get him out, it counts as a balk. Yeah. He is going, and it's taking ball four. And so the Tigers in business now after Brewer works a walk his 13th of the year. Now here's Parker. James Parker, a local product from T.L. Hanna High School, about 25 minutes up the road. He's been outstanding this year for the Tigers. 346, a couple of home runs, and he's played a heck of a shortstop defensively, too. Deep breath for Acosta. A little bit high there, ball one. He's got 18 hits on the year. Six of them are for extra bases. Leads the team in doubles with four and also has the two home runs. Casas 1-0 pitch. Hit high in the air. That's popped up. Shortstop sees it and makes the play. Rain has already let up out here. We thought it would at some point fairly quickly at the start of things. And that has certainly helped the sky. It was really hazy to start the game. You kind of wondered if a little pop-up like that. Now time's call. We got a pitching coach visit to the mound before Caden Grice. And this may just be a brief reminder because you don't want to make a mistake to him. Caden Grice already, uh, his reputation is probably spreading across at least the opposing scouting reports. Five home runs, many of them long, long distance. He's the type of guy that uh, people are going to come to the ballpark to see him play. You know, when I first came here in 1978, I replaced uh, Al Adams, who left to start the orange and white. And he told me, you know, Clemson used to, uh, people used to come to Clemson basketball games just to see Tree Rollins, just to see what he would do next. And I think this kid can be the same way in, uh, in baseball. Very similar to Seth Beer when he was here. Correct. Now an opportunity. The spot where Clemson has had a real problem lately coming through. Acosta trying to slow this game to a halt, and he rushed it by Grice at 86. Owen won the count. Okay. 
One thing about the Panthers, we did find out that they are willing to be deliberate. And we see it with Acosta here. As soon as Meredith got on base, he really wound down the tempo. And it's a strategy that works quite well. As long as the infield and outfield are okay with it. Really throws an offense off when you do it that way. You got the big shift. Uh, going second baseman is a uh, answer to the short fielder in a softball game out in right field. You see that shift. Big hole to left center. We've seen Grice hit some base hits right there. One of his five home runs is out to left center field. Way down now to Acosta, though. Big 0-2 pitch here. Missed outside. Good eye. Not a bad ratio for a home run hitter. 11 strikeouts and eight walks so far this year. Has an 800 slugging percentage. Which obviously leads the team. Acosta checks the runner. Now looks to the plate. Strike three called. And that's how the inning will end. A good comeback against the heart of the order for Rafael Acosta in his first inning as a starter. He punches out a power hitter in Caden Grice to send us to the second scoreless here at Duck Kingsmore Stadium. Take a look at this gauntlet right here. This is Georgia State's schedule already this season. Not only you come and play a team like Clemson in the midweek, it's one of the apex moments for you. Uh, not for this crowd, Tim. All they do is play ranked teams, and they've got a, a couple of good wins, particularly early in that series with West Virginia. Yeah, well, they've got, you know, they only have four wins, but they're all against ranked teams. How many teams in the country have four ranked wins already? They're one of them. I would say that the strength of schedule rankings, you probably could draw a big, fat, bold line underneath Georgia State to whoever's second. Because there's no way anybody else has played that kind of gauntlet here early on. Yeah, they played multiple teams that were ranked second in the nation by at least one of the polls. Obviously, uh, they, Vanderbilt and Florida are recent national champions. They played both of them. You see an energetic dugout. Boy, you get 4-13. and 13 at, I don't care who you play. That can get a little discouraging, but a lot of encouragement coming from that third base dugout. Now, when they beat Vanderbilt, they were ranked second, and that's the highest ranked win in the history of the program. They beat Georgia Tech when they were 10th in one of the polls. And the two wins against uh, West Virginia when they were 14th in one of the polls. Elian Marejo calls time. One two count to him. Uh, the highest ranked, 16 highest ranked wins in Georgia State history. Four of them have taken place this year already. And that get a whole lot easier. I mean, it'll get a little easier because that's not sustainable right there. You're going to get into. Sunbelt Conference play, but they've still got a couple of midweeks that are potentially treacherous for them. Strike three called. You can see Ricky Williams. He has got a confident gait as he walks around the mound after that strikeout. Here's another look at it. Nice breaking ball. Caught the corner. Looks like we might have a bit of a wide strike zone today, so pitcher's taking advantage of it on both sides so far. Williams working fastball, breaking ball here early against this all right-handed lineup. Now Josh Smith, he takes the strike in there. Owen won the count. Josh is from College Park, Georgia. Coming into this week, he led the Sun Belt in walks with 10. 
He's going to have to do a heck of a work to get one here as he's down in the count 0 and 2. Williams, a little bit different philosophy of how to work on the mound than his counterpart, Acosta, working very quickly. Gets the ball right on the mound, goes back to work. Here's a 1 2. Strike three. Back to back strikeouts for Williams and a very similar pitch there, Tim. Here's another look at it. Yep, nice curveball. Catching the outside corner. That's three strikeouts he's recorded, or two strikeouts, where he's uh, got the ball in the outside corner. To their all right handed hitting lineup. Now Griffin Cheney, Jr. Another breaking ball for a strike. Why in the world would you throw anything else? You see the numbers. Johns Creek, Georgia. We talked about Clemson's issues with a six game losing streak. The Panthers in their seven game losing skid coming in have only scored a combined seven runs in those games since a 10-1 win at Georgia Tech on March the 3rd. So they have really been mired in an offensive slump too. A little bit high. Didn't miss by much right there. He went with that curveball again, hung it a little bit. Cheney got to protect the wide strike zone. He couldn't do it. Ricky Williams strikes out the side in the second inning. We had to break with a look at the last one. How about the freshman in his debut? Still scoreless as we head to the bottom of the second. Here's a look at Adam Hackenberg in the DH spot tonight. He is yet to appear in a game this year, making his first plate appearance. He is a co-captain on this team, but has been working his way back from an arm injury and was just cleared to resume hitting recently and cleared for game action tonight. Good to see him in the lineup. I'm sure for Monty Lee and his coaching staff especially. Yeah, especially from the leadership standpoint, as you can see, won the team leadership award last year. He's a co-captain, uh, got a good bat, but that leadership's important. Now they'll be anxious to get him back behind the plate, too. He started 17 games behind the plate last year when he hit 295. One thing he didn't do last year was hit a home run. Speaking to Monty Lee a few days ago, and he mentioned that in the time that he's seen Hackenberg in the cages and taking a little batting practice, that he's barreled the ball up with hard contact better than he's ever seen. And particularly on this team where Tigers went to Chapel Hill and they took a full roster of players. Only 10 had ever been on an ACC Road Series. Very, very young and inexperienced. And Hackenberg gives a little bit of that at least. He fouled that one off to stay alive, one and two. Low curve while they're just 78 miles an hour. Hackenberg was a 39th round draft choice but the Kansas City Royals out of high school as the player of the year in the state of Pennsylvania his senior year. Of course, his brother Christian, former Penn State and NFL quarterback. Hackenberg hits one in the air back to right. Easily playable for Pearson. There's absolutely no wind. Uh, at this moment in the game, the flags are limp out in the outfield. The air it seems kind of heavy just because of the rain we've had. And I assume the humidity is up there. Here's Jonathan French. He can hit it out whether it's humid or not. A lot of power in his bat. Struggled at the plate. Chapel Hill.
Pitch missed away. Your humidity number, 92%. 92%, there you are. That is an official reading. Marchman, check out the crouch behind the plate. Always oh, stands out. You wonder if a uh, catcher like French batting, kind of just glancing back there going, maybe I ought to try that sometime. <laughs> Either that or I can't believe you catch that way. A little bit unorthodox. Watch that split. Here's a 1-1. One, one. Good pitch. He ran it under his hands for strike two. First catcher I can remember doing that in the major leagues was Manny Sanguian. He used to throw runners out from that position, was an all-star catcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates. You got to be strong as an ox to do that, and he was. 1-2 to French. That ball's ripped to right center field. Is it going to carry enough? It is. It did. Wow. You called it. You said he could hit it a home run out in any degree <laughs> of humidity. And that's the first home run of the year hit with a 92% humidity, Claude. <laughs> Put a star by it. That's home run four for Jonathan French, and that gets him out of a mini slump, and it gets the Tigers on the board here first. He had two strikes on him, too, so he had to be thinking about that. I know he had a game in Chapel Hill. He struck out four times, so. But he, you know, I liked how he went with the pitch, too. It was kind of high and outside, but he went with it beautifully and uh, hit the back fence of those bleachers out there in right center. Estimated distance, 397 feet. Like that. He's mad it hit the fence. Might have gotten a four in front of that. Yeah. There's a strike to Briar Hawkins, a third baseman today. That ball was ripped off the bat, too. Hawkins fouls it off. That was the 16th home run of the year by Clemson hitters. The fourth by French, who's now just one behind Grice for the team lead. It was the 23rd home run given up by Georgia State pitching this year. There's a bouncer. Good scoop on the short hop by the third baseman, Puckett, to get the out. That is a fine play, especially given how wet the infield is. Sometimes the hops are a little bit unpredictable. Now here's Bryce Teodosio. And if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. He's hitting 281. If he does that the whole year, he'll never sit. And he's hit in the arm. Now, I didn't move much, but then again, it was a breaking ball. So I think it just kind of froze. Let's see. Elbow pad helped. Elbow pad helped. Did he even feel it? Probably not, but uh, that was the kind of pitch that an umpire might call you back. Now, you know what the most famous callback by an umpire on a hit by pitch is in Major League history? The most famous one. Most famous instance of an umpire calling a batter back. What's that? Uh, Don Drysdale in the 60s was facing Dick Dietz of the Giants. A little before my time. A little bit before your time. This is probably 68 because everything in pitching happened in 68 as Teodosio advances to second for stolen base. So Drysdale had this long streak going of scoreless innings. And I think Oral Hershiser has since broken. As you can see the jump by uh, Teodosio. So the bases were loaded, and Dick Dietz was hit, and it was going to end the streak, and um, the umpire called him back. Said, no, you didn't get out. You try to get out of the way. And so the streak went on. You got to love when everybody's on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> 
Meredith fouls it back, one and one. Could you imagine if that happened today, how social media would light up? Yeah. That would lead MLB Network for four days. It would. MLB would do a documentary. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they would. <laughs> Kier Meredith ripped one through the right side. He's got a ton of real estate up the middle and to the right of the second base bag. I mean, a ton of room. Tigers looking for an elusive hit with runners in scoring position. They have just two hits with runners in scoring position in their last six games. And they are 0 for 2 tonight. Now 2 for 36 in their last seven games, counting the first inning and two-thirds today. Meredith looked like he made contact with the catcher, Marchman, that time. And those are the kind of numbers, like I would consider myself a stats nerd. Those are the kinds of numbers that it's impossible not to correct. Like, that has to correct by accident. Yeah, over time, I would say so, yes. One-two pitch to Meredith. Kier looking to drive in the second run of the inning. Acosta with a triple check of the runner, and Meredith got tired of waiting there. And Acosta's done a pretty good job. He's given up some base runners, but really controlled Meredith well. Now doing the same with Teodosio. A couple of good base runners. Here, grounds one foul. Tigers making Acosta work right now. Moving up two hits, a walk, and two strikeouts. He's also hit a batter. It has been an eventful first couple of innings on the mound for him. And still a 1-2 count due Meredith. Teodosio going to score on any hit. Oh, and it hit him. It bounced and hit him in the back of his front leg. That feels like just over gripping the ball on a little bit of a slick, rainy day. Boy, that didn't make it halfway. No, that was a bounce pass. <laughs> Two hit batters in the inning now. And Acosta, I know he's got the walk of Brewer, but he's had pretty good command to this point. He did hit Teodosio with the first pitch, but was ahead of Meredith. And got to think again, just every now and then, even though it's not raining anymore, every now and then the ball's going to be slick enough that pitcher's going to lose a grip on a night like this. It was a 27th hit batter by Georgia State pitching this year. So it seems like a lot. I would say so. By contrast, Clemson's pitching has hit 12. Henderson, the fly ball to center field. Should end the inning and will. But not before the Tigers get a run. Jonathan French goes opposite field and out to right center field for his fourth home run of the season. And the Tigers take an early lead in the second. Here's Brad Stromdahl. Look at him, an upbeat coach in the third base dugout. Eight seasons as the head coach at Georgia Gwinnett. How about a 752 win percentage? How about taking the program to the NAIA World Series in just his second year, which was just the second year of the program? Not too shabby, I would say. Three trips to the NAIA World Series, including in 2018 and 2019, when his teams win a combined 98 and 25. Of course, he had ties to Georgia State. He was an assistant coach before he went the NAIA route. And because he's so successful, they brought him back. 1-1 one, one count facing Ashby Smith, the DH, who is talking about all the 
Georgia natives a little bit earlier. Smith, not one of those. He is a native of Gaffney, South Carolina, back in his home state. Not a normal starter, but hitting 348 in his limited action so far this year. Good rip and a foul down the third baseline. Two and two count, Deuce Smith here. Bottom of the order facing Ricky Williams. Freshman who has not seen any action thus far in the early going this season. All he's done is come in and retire the first six batters he faced, including back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back strikeouts in the second. It's been pretty economical, too. Only 27 pitches thrown in the first two innings. Tried to fight one off. Can Grice get there? He cannot. Yeah, Smith, the guy, slugging percentage of 435, would rank third on the team if he had qualifying numbers, hasn't hit quite enough to get there yet. Making his seventh start. And there's a tip into the mitt. And again, Ricky Williams has got the Panthers lineup totally out of sorts. Stealing a line from your broadcasting associate earlier today. So far, it's been a Heisman-like performance by Ricky Williams. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> you could have taken credit. I wouldn't have told her. Um, it would get back to her. Somebody, somebody <laughs> would tweet it. That's true. Williams steals down low ball one to Kyle Rieselman. Freshman center fielder. Good-looking athlete. 255 hitter. First time he's gone 2-0 and on a batter. Rieselman has struggled with strikeouts. Three walks to 20 Ks and 47 at-bats. Williams has missed outside now. A couple of times in a row. It's 3-0. Outside corner strike. Rieselman trying to be the first base runner against Williams, and he will. Seven up, seven down for Ricky Williams, and now for the first time in his collegiate career, he'll have to pick out a pitch out of the stretch. Announcer jinx. Yeah, it was. You think that our kind would learn, but some things you just have to share, even though you know it's going to ruin it. Blaine Marchman, catcher in today's game, making his fifth start. He's appeared in eight games off the bench. A pop foul out of play down toward Clemson's bullpen. Interested to see the Panthers on the bases. They are unafraid to line the proverbial top. 21 stolen base attempts, 13 sacrifice bunts on the season. Good pitch there. 0-2 the count. Opponents have stolen 11 out of 16 bases against the Tigers this year. Not a bad percentage from a Clemson standpoint. Pretty good lead out at first base. There's a grounder up the middle. Williams knocked it down, and they're not going to get anybody out. Looked like a double play ball off the bat, Tim. It ends up being an infield single. Yep, that's a shame. That's the first hit he's given up for his career. I guess he'll remember that. An odd first hit to give up. And, uh, give Georgia State first and second with one out. And we go back to the top of the order. And Pearson fly out to right field. He saw six pitches all strikes his first time. He 
know, in plays like that, former Clemson pitcher and radio broadcaster Bob Mahoney always says that you have to go against your nature and just let that go. He said it's the hardest thing in the world not to try to make that play because the ball is hit right at you and your instincts are telling you to go toward it, not away from it. Right. Williams all of a sudden missing away. Falling off the mound to the first base side and it's affecting his location off the outside corner. Runners lead first and second now. One out. A little bit low. He had no control problems his first two innings. I think he only threw seven balls in the first two innings combined. Now, Andrew C. is going to come out, the pitching coach of the Tigers, have a conversation. And the Tigers do have some action in the bullpen as Nick Hoffman is throwing. You see the ball strike totals for Williams. He's thrown eight balls this inning. After throwing eight balls and 19 strikes in the first two innings of work. Here you see Hoffman. In the top of the third inning. Clemson has now scored first in four straight games. Getting out to early leads has not been the issue with this team as of late. Giving the leads back has been. And that's ball four. And the bases are loaded all of a sudden for Ricky Williams. And now he's got to face Will Mize. Their leading hitter, 371 average coming into this game. Bounce back to the shortstop his first time up. Did Mize. Coming into the game. A time called at the plate. Coming off a one for five day against Kentucky. Did have a three hit game against the Wildcats last Friday. Had seven multi hit games this year already. There's a fly ball hit to right center. That ball's hit pretty well. Teodosio will make the catch. That will get one run in. A good piece of hitting there by Mize, who did the job of the sack fly to tie the score at one. Interesting that uh, with the control problems that he had, the, he went after the early pitch, but he got the run in. Rieselman scores the first run of the game for the Panthers. And again, Mize gets the RBI. Marchman went over to third. So Williams not out of the woods yet, as Tim said. Now runners on the corners. With two outs, Kalen Puckett. Ground out to second base. And time call. They're going to go to the bullpen. So Williams will exit after facing 11 batters and giving up the one run. And we'll tell you about his replacement, Nick Hoffman, when we return to the ballpark in just a moment. Nick Hoffman, the first pitcher to come out of the Clemson bullpen today. Freshman out of Centerville, Ohio. The last time he appeared in the game for the Tigers was awfully good. There you see his season numbers with that 477 ERA. More than half of his innings at five and two third came on Friday. He came on in relief of Davis Sharp, who got the start and pitched three solid innings against North Carolina. Gave up a couple of runs, really only made one mistake. But no walks and two strikeouts. Monty Lee and his staff all very complimentary of the way Hoffman threw in relief on Friday. And they may ask him to get a bunch of outs today, Tim. 
Yeah, they might. They, but they sh should be pleased with the performance of Ricky Williams, though, in his first career appearance. Struck out four, walk two. It's two and two thirds innings, giving up one run and one hit so far. French throws back to first and will chase the runner. There was a look at third. You never quite know what's happening on plays like that. Hoffman inherits the two runners and a square to Bond and a strike taken. Told you 13 sacrifice bunts for this team. Puckett's got two of them. Got five guys with multiple sack bunts. That ball is roped into right field, but foul. Team like this, it likes to sacrifice. They like to run the bases just a little bit. A lot of times you end up playing for one run when you do that. You've got the sack fly now with two outs. Looking for a hit somewhere. Just upstairs from Hoffman, it's two and two. Well, if you look at the statistics of both teams, you can see how both coaches uh, may think this could be a low scoring close game. So you can see why they might play it that way. 2-2, bouncer to short, Parker to Henderson. And the side is retired. A 1-1 score through two and a half here at the ballpark as Georgia State battles back. There you see Monty Lee. Got the mask on down in the first base dugout. His sixth year as a head coach at Clemson. Hasn't been in a whole lot of seasons like this in his career. Impressive stint in the, the College of Charleston and as you see there, an ACC Tournament Championship in his resume. Eight NCAA appearances. And he's made the NCAA Tournament in all five years he's been at Clemson. I guess four years he's been at Clemson. Last year notwithstanding, obviously with the season being shut down early. This team's got a little bit of work to do to get there with a very young roster, though. Yes, uh, you know, he's talked about Trying to, uh, you know, find the right li lineup. And you don't have those extra non-conference games to try to work some things out. So it's a little bit tougher this year. I was speaking with a former player about that just a few days ago, about how important it is to play a few extra non-conference games before the series get very serious. And in this case, for Clemson, face South Carolina the second series. They've been an ACC play ever since. It's been very difficult. Georgia State got no such on ramp. <laughs> they jumped right into the deep end of the pool. Dylan Brewer walked his first time up. Counts even to him one and one. Yeah, their players could vote in the uh, all SEC team. Uh, <laughs> hell. Right now. Way out in front of that pitch, Brewer. Costa had him completely fooled. You don't see that very often. No, he's got a good eye at the plate and walked the first time up, which I think was what his 13th walk of the year. Like that. 13th walk. 13 walks to 14 strikeouts for Brewer. Yeah, any time a batter has more walks than strikeouts, that's pretty amazing. Fouled that one away. I saw a tweet earlier this week on one of those baseball sites. Johnny Mize is still the only player in Major League history to hit 50 home runs and strike out less than 50 times in a season. That's almost impossible. There's strike three. Dylan Brewer didn't love that call. That's been a strike consistently today. It's a first out. Here's another look at Acosta. Yeah, might have caught the inside black. Looked a little more questionable. It always does when the pitcher doesn't hit the catcher's spot. 
pretty good call, though, to me. In today's game, I, I could not imagine with the approach it takes to 50 home runs, I can't imagine we'll ever see anything remotely close to that again. Yeah. I was reading a, I think it was in The Athletic, breakdown from Joey Votto the other day about how to basically stave off old age and multiple ways to do it. And he said, basically, you can't just try to do everything anymore. You have to sacrifice one thing for another. One of the things he said is, are you going to sacrifice a little bit of power to make contact and try to spray the ball? Or are you going to maybe strike out a few more times for power? He said, at some point, you have to choose a lane. Right. That was an interesting way to look at it. James Parker, who strike one. Still ahead, two balls and a strike as he popped out to the shortstop. Here's the replay, and there you see the ever-expanding strike zone of Rusty Griffin. Two-two the count now as Parker fights it off. The goal here, if you're Acosta, is to face Caden Grice with options. So you don't have to go after him if you don't want to. Right. Although he did a good job striking him out looking his first time up. That's Parker it. hits it in the air. Might have just missed it. Up underneath it for the second out. Got a little under it. I'm like you, Tim. I. It looked like it was going to be well hit. Yeah. It didn't carry very well out to left field, though. A little under it. So now, Caden Grice will come to the plate with nobody on, and Acosta with all the tools in the tool chest at his disposal. Again, he had Grice way off balance the first time up, so he may just want to come after him no matter what. He did try to come after him with a fastball there and missed with it. One one the score in the top of the third, bottom of the third rather. Georgia State just scored one in the top of the third to tie it after Jonathan French, who's in the hole right now for Clemson. Started the scoring with a solo home run in the bottom of the second inning. 2-0 to Grice. Oh, big swing and a miss. Took a little off that, just 83 miles an hour. He's been successful against Christ with some off-speed stuff. Strike two. The Georgia State bullpen is an active place right now. But Acosta looks to be in a pretty good groove. We've been told that they like to uh, use many pitchers in a game. Ball three outside. And also thinking that perhaps a second time through the order is all she wrote for Acosta. I think the coaching staff would probably be fine with that. 3-2 pitch. Grice rips it, and it's caught. Right at the third baseman, 110 miles an hour off the bat. A line out ends the third inning. We're tied at one here in Clemson. We'll be back in a moment. 1-1 one, one the score through three innings of play. A lot of good pitching from a couple of freshman starters. Acosta for the Panthers and Williams for the Tigers. And now it's a right-hander Nick Hoffman in the game. There you see the numbers for Clemson's bullpen as that ball is hammered. Down the left field line and foul. Well, that was a heck of a time to do that as we were just going to sing the praises of Clemson's collective bullpen the last two days. Ilian Marejo just hit a car. Goodness gracious. There's a little cue shot down the first baseline. French calls Hoffman off and will make the play. Good communication there. 
Very good play. Showed some speed and getting out from behind the plate. Ball's hit and spun weird, and you can see French calling off Hoffman, who kind of olays him. And he throws him out. Now we can address the bullpen for Clemson. We finally get to get a chance to do that. 12 and two thirds. The last couple games, a scoreless baseball. Nick Hoffman responsible for three innings out of the bullpen in Friday night's game, but Monty Lee has said repeatedly, this is the strength of this team, is the depth of talent they have in the bullpen. And I know we'd like to go deeper into the game with the starters, but you've got to be pleased, even in a pinch, with what the bullpen's been able to do the last couple of games to keep the opponent at bay. Yeah, I gave up five runs in the uh, first inning against North Carolina, and they didn't score the rest of the game. Strike three call, Josh Smith up and down quickly. The second out here in the top of the fourth. A nasty pitch from Hoffman to punch him out. Fifth strikeout for Clemson pitching. Well, he's set up out there. Two outs. Griffin Cheney, the batter. Strike call. And we talked about Hoffman's numbers. He has been victimized by the long ball. Five and two thirds innings. Gave up the one home run against the Tar Heels over the weekend. And is a good pitch to contact guy. Also good at stranding inherited runners. He's one of those guys that they can bring in in the middle of an inning and feel good that whatever traffic's on the base paths will stay there until the side's retired. Long look to get the sign there from French. Here's a one-two pitch. Misses, two and two. One pitch away from a quick and easy fourth inning for Hoffman. Can he bring it? He cannot. There's a cue shot foul. That ball is ripped right off the very tip of the bat. Four through seven hitters in the Panthers order all struck out in order against Ricky Williams back in the second and third innings. Smith struck out a second time. Chaney looking to strike out for a second time, and that one misses. It's three and two. French really setting up on the outside corner. Of course, he's gotten that pitch, but a little bit too far outside that time. Here comes the payoff. Popped him up. That's going to carry out to right field. Brewer tracks it, makes the catch, and the inning is over. Three straight sat down by Nick Hoffman. We head to the bottom of four, still tied at one. New pitcher in the game for the Panthers, another freshman, Dylan Metella. 6'3", 205. You see the numbers with that nine ERA and in five innings over four appearances. A little bit of an issue with walks, but a good strikeout pitcher. Yeah, nine to seven. He uh, his season high in innings pitch is one and two thirds against West Virginia on the 21st. Had a couple of strikeouts in that game. Faced 10 opponent batters in that game. be Adam Hackenberg leading things off for the Tigers against the new arm. Fly out to right field. That's how he entered the ball game. Right hand batter stands in. Here's a pitch to him. And it hit him on the elbow. Right out of the gate. 
And he's a base runner for this guy, Jonathan French. First time up, Tim. He went opposite field and out of here. He did. He went with the pitch beautifully and knocked it over the right center field fence for his fourth home run of the year. Second most among Tigers at this juncture of the season. 107 off the bat for the exit velocity. 397. You see 19.94 degree launch angle. That is a line drive if I've ever seen it. And this ball jumped out of here. We've had virtually no wind the entire game. And it remains that way. Clouds just sitting over the stadium. Big swing and a miss for French. Spun out of his shoes on a breaking pitch there. French, a guy, again, who to start the season had hits in six of seven games. And in his last four, he was just one for 13 coming in. And he's now two for two tonight. Hackenberg, round second. He'll stop, wisely so. Ball's cut off well by Rieselman. And the Tigers are in business now with two on and nobody out. And this is where Monty Lee is just desperately looking for somebody to get a big hit and drive somebody in. Maybe Briar Hawkins can be that guy. He grounded to the third baseman his first time up. Two hits now for French going the opposite way. You know, there are certain guys, and you could think about it in the big leagues. You can look at the collegiate level as well, particularly now as things like launch angle and hitting philosophy have changed quite a bit. Let's see what Hawkins does. It Corners are pinched really tight and on the lines looking for a potential bunt here. You see it's more and more. You see the infield alignment. They're going for a double play, but first and third base. First baseman was in two more steps than that on the last pitch. Third baseman's kind of non-committal. There's a strike. Scoring around. Tigers have four sacrifice hits all year which is one more than the 1988 Clemson team had the entire season. Under How about Bill that? Helm. I once asked Coach Wilhelm. Oh, oh, throw back to second, and they almost caught Hackenberg. That was close. I asked Coach Wilhelm that year, Coach, why don't you, why don't you bunt more? He said, Tim, I've got Red Gill and Ray Williams and Mike Kuchar, I can steal the base without giving up an out. Why would I want to give up an out? And if you look in the Clemson record book, 188 steals that year. Oh. Most in Clemson history for one season. 188? 188. Henry Threadgill and Kuchar, I think tied for the single season record that year. I think Ray Williams graduated by then, but. He was uh, also a great base dealer in that era. 2-1 pitch. Oh, it's fouled straight back. He just missed it. What I was saying about French earlier, taking the ball the other way, there are some guys where you know, particularly power hitters, that they're seeing the ball well. Even if they're getting hits, if they're all on the pull side, eh, they're probably going to pop some up, going to be some weak contact in there. But when guys are going the opposite field, you know they're feeling good, they're comfortable, and their swing is right. And French is one of those guys. Time call. Briar Hawkins, another one of those guys. Has a tendency to be a bit of a pull hitter, but can hit the ball and does have pop, particularly to the right center field gap. It's seven home runs the last time we had a full season in 2019. 2-2, two, two, and they'll bluff Hackenberg back. Again, Matella, just like Acosta before him, trying to control the run game with tempo. And not even trying to cut down a potential steal because Hackenberg is certainly not doing that, but maybe the difference between scoring on a base hit and not. 
Another stare down back there. We were playing that minor league rule you were talking about. We would long since have runners at second. <laughs> so you're saying you're an advocate now. 2-2 <laughs> two -two pitch. Swung on and missed. Up at the top of the zone, he got him to strike out on a fastball. First out of the inning and a big one. Looks like Hawkins might have expected that to sink a little bit. Two-seam fastball that stayed up. He swung right underneath it. I'm Bryce Teodosio. We barely said his name. He was hit by a pitch back in the second inning. Takes ball one. Big spot for Teodosio. Now time's called. It's another visit to the mound. This time it's the pitching coach Matt Taylor out there once again. And he's a look at him. He is upset. Well, he is getting after the infield right now. This is a demonstrative conversation. Very rarely do you see this. Comes the home plate out, umpire. I'll just see what's going on. You know, notoriously, these conversations are quite secretive most of the time. Muted response from pitcher, catcher, coach, everybody. Rarely do you see pretty demonstrative body language out there. Wish we had the NFL films crew here to uh, hear what he was saying. <laughs> and it's crazy because it's a 1 0 count. And he came right out and fussed at the left side of the infield. So you wonder if a play was supposed to be on, if something wasn't happening correctly. We maybe don't know about. 1 0 pitch. Check swing. Did he go? No. Says John Mary at first base. 2-0 the count now to Teodosio. Tigers had a chance to at least advance these runners. Hawkins struck out. Teodosio, one of two guys with a chance to get him in. Pop foul, straight back out of play. Teodosio in his career, we talked about this, as good a defensive center fielder as there is in college baseball. He's got just one hit in his last six games, but he's taken more walks. He's been more disciplined. He's had a willingness to shorten his swing when the situation calls for it. He did not shorten his swing there, and it's two and two. We're more likely to choke up on the bat. Poke a ball in the right field a little bit every now and then. Yeah, he's probably made more thrilling diving catches in the outfield than any other Tiger the last three years. And he's got some pop. He's got the most career home runs among the active Tigers. I think he's got 14. 2-2, two -two, way upstairs. In terms of position players, Clemson really has a lengthy history of two things, short stops and center fielders. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The only four-time first-team All-ACC player in Clemson history was a guy named Neil Simons who played center field from 77 to 80. Way outside, and Teodosio takes a walk to load the bases with one out. If I'm filling a lineup in every day and you see the 3-2 pitch to Teodosio way outside. If I'm filling out a lineup every day, I want my nine man to be able to get the lineup back around. And so far today, Teodosio has done that. 
He has hit batter and a walk. Also has a stolen base. No opportunity to do that here with the bases loaded and one out. Can Meredith break the fever? You see those runners all leading. First, second, third as the rain picks up here at the ballpark. And the pitch bounces up there. Great stop by the catcher. We knew coming in today, it might rain a little bit at the beginning of the game. I'm Honestly, I'm a little bit surprised that they started it on time. Because it did rain for a few minutes and then it slacked off considerably and then ceased. And now it's picked back up. You can see it there in the camera. Looking pretty good right now. But that rain is not supposed to hang around for very long. Take a look at this pitch. Pretty good. Here on the inside edge. Runners lead everywhere. And a throw down to third. Snap throw by the catcher. And yeah, there's no way. Third base umpire said Meredith didn't go around. Really? That's a lot of stuff for a third base umpire to have to check. See the throw down to give a look to Hackenberg. And then they asked him to adjudicate the check swing. That's right. There's a lot going on. Two for two for Patrick Graham on that one. Bravo. Meredith in a hitter's count now with the bases loaded. And he takes inside. You got to give Clemson credit for this. Against North Carolina this past weekend, they scored 10 runs. Just under half of those runs were either by a walk or a hit by pitch. And there's another bases loaded walk drawn by Meredith. And the Tigers are back in front, two to one. Counts as an RBI just like anything else. Meredith's done his job. He's gotten a base three times now. How many times did the Tigers walk with the bases loaded in North Carolina? Three times? Three times, I believe. Time called. They're going to go to the bullpen here, and they are. The Panthers will. We'll tell you about the new arm here in just a moment. Tigers have regained the lead. And the Panthers are going back to the bullpen. The leader in appearances coming into today out of the Panthers bullpen, Trey Horton, into the game. 6'2", junior from Ackworth, Georgia. A good arm right here. You can tell that the Panthers do not want this lead going any more than 2-1 to one at this juncture. Yeah, both coaches are kind of... Uh... <laughs> Coaching this like the seventh game of a World Series, and that they don't want either one of them wanted to get it away from them, so they're going to make a lot of pitching changes to try to stem the tide. Four runs, three earned, five walks, nine strikeouts. He's given up eight hits in those 13 innings, and we have talked about it. this is a this is a big game for both of these teams. Georgia State, they're trying to stop a seven-game slide. And for Clemson, they're trying to stop a six-game slide here. And neither team is going to see a whole lot of rest for the weary coming as the uh, as the season continues because it's tough series after tough series for both of them. Yeah, the Tigers will face a ranked Virginia Tech team this weekend. And Georgia State goes into conference play. I think they go to Louisiana Monroe. That's right. I know former national champion Coastal Carolina is also in their conference in the Sun Belt. Gary Gilmore always with a strong squad. There's a excuse me swing by Henderson. He fouls it. Henderson a strikeout and a flyout. He left two guys stranded back in the second inning. Pitch, a little bit high. Well, that's been a strike today. It's 
a strike most days. Pretty good pitch. One one offering. Strike two. Shot. That's going to be a fielder's choice picked up by the second baseman. Tigers still don't get the elusive hit with runners in scoring position, but they'll take the RBI as that ball hopped just high enough to give the second baseman a chance at it. Give Henderson the RBI on a weird play in the middle of the diamond. Check this out. Yeah, it was almost fielded by the pitcher, and then second baseman comes over, and Mize had to kind of do a little two-step to find the bag, but he did in time to get the out. But the Tigers do get another run and take a three-to-one lead. So we have Teodosio at third and Henderson at first. Give Henderson the RBI. That's his second of the year. See Dylan Brewer is a throw over to first, and Teodosio jumps off a third. Two good base runners on the bases right now for Clemson. So they've got a little bit of cushion at three to one. A little bit low on Brewer, ball one. Walking a strikeout for Dylan so far today. Fouls it back, one and one. That was a fastball down the middle. Right-hander Horton undeterred by Brewer. Coming it right in there. One, one pitch. Fouled into the mitt. Yeah, he wants to, Horton wants to make it happen against Brewer because the Tigers' leading hitter on deck, James Parker, to be followed by Grice. And yeah, this is really the money spot. This is why you bring Horton into the game. And Brad Stromdahl looks like a genius. Brings him in, got the ground out that scored a run but limited the damage. You can see Brewer blown away by the fastball, but the Tigers lead 3-1 as we head to the fifth. Tigers now lead once again 3-1 after they manufactured two in the bottom half of the fourth. And now it's the Panthers' turn to see if they can answer. In the top of the fifth against the second Tiger reliever, Nick Hoffman. Glad to have you with us. Alongside Tim Beret, I'm William Quackenbush. Thanks for being here on a rainy, drizzly, overcast, gloomy Tuesday night for baseball. Here's Ashby Smith. He struck out, had a nice exchange, six pitches with Ricky Williams, the starter for the Tigers, and he struck out. Hoffman has faced four batters out of the bullpen. He's done his job. He's retired all four of them. Big swing and a miss by Smith there. No balls and a strike. Hoffman quickly back to work. This is a little bit outside. Laced over the third baseman and fair down into the corner. That'll be an easy double for Ashby Smith to start things off for the Panthers. Their second hit of the day here in the fifth. Like a hanging breaking ball there. Yeah, it looked like a hanging breaking ball that he actually pulled an outside pitch, which most times is going to lead to a ground ball to the shortstop. But that time he got the big part of the bat on it and was able to Get around on it and 
will knock it down the line for the first extra base hit of the game for Georgia State. Kyle Rieselman walked and scored back in the third. Smith running at second. Talked about how well he's played. They try to bunny fouls it. And Smith, just a seventh start, but of all the guys in this lineup, we know Will Mize is a stud. Smith, the way he's swinging the bat, he looks like he's second. Yeah, he's nine for 25. It's a 360 average. Now, well, Rieselman, who's tied for the team lead, or he's got the team lead. As a matter of fact, with three sack bunts, couldn't lay one down, then swings through strike two. Lane Marchman, the other hit on the day for the Panthers is on deck, and there's ball one outside. Neither team has a hit so far. We're runners in scoring position. The Panthers just 0 for 1. Tigers 0 for 6 right now. Pitch. Strike three called. And Matt, we can look at it again. Jonathan French made that one a strike. Check out this frame job behind the plate. Well, he did. Rusty Griffin gave it the a little extra French pastry there at the end. <laughs> Is the one, two, three, fourth called strikeout by Clemson pitching today. Second for Hoffman. He's faced six batters, struck out two of them. And there's a strike on the outside corner to Marchman, the nine hitter. Panthers trying to get that run in, time called. They tried to get him around. This is the kind of team that plays a lot of small ball. You look at their slugging percentage. They've only got nine home runs on the year in 17 games. You look at the slugging percentage, only 347. Swing and a miss there. And the on-base percentage, only 343. So if you get a guy at second with nobody out in a two-run game, they're in get him over, get him in mentality. And now they're behind the eight ball in that as not only did Rieselman strike out, but Marchman's now down in the count 0-2. Oh, just missed down and away, 1-2. and two. Hoffman, the second Clemson pitcher today. There you see him. Looking in to get his sign. Here he comes to the plate. Missed in tight two and two. Hoffman freshman from Centerville, Ohio. Pitched a bit last year as well. Two two pitch off the plate. Marchman has worked it full. Three two pitch at the end of the bat. Henderson's got a hustle and he does make the throw. You're right. That did have a little odd English to it. Henderson had to stay with it as it went off the end of the bat. Smith advances to third. That was a tough play for Henderson there because I think he was expecting it off the bat to jump at him. And it was kind of a lazy ground ball. And give Marchman credit for sprinting out of the box. And that's going to be all for Nick Hoffman. Tigers going to go back to the bullpen. We'll tell you about the new Clemson reliever with the Tigers up 3-1 when we return to Doug Kingsmore Stadium after this. Last time the Panthers went to the bullpen, they brought in Trey Horton, their leader in appearances. The most often used Clemson reliever is this guy, Rasesh Pandia. A Wofford transfer, a junior who's put up really good numbers for the most part this year. You see that minuscule ERA 
He's done a really good job pitching to contact on the season. Yeah, he's got a 1.42 ERA. This is his seventh appearance. He's pitched six and a third innings, given up four hits, four run all earned, 17 to four. Strike out to walk ratio, 17 strike. Uh, no, excuse me, I'm looking at the different line. Looking at Mac Elgin's line. Four strikeouts and three walks in his six and a third innings. It's only given up one earned run in six and a third innings. I think Pandy would take Anglin's line. <laughs> He'd take credit for it. There's a yes, call hey, strike. If you had 17 strikeouts <laughs> in six and a third innings, <laughs> that would be nearly impossible. What is that, 19 outs? <laughs> <laughs> that would be, yeah. Fly ball, shoot in it. Easy play for Teodosio, and Pandia gets out of it with the runner stranded at third. Tigers lead 3-1 halfway through. Back inside Doug Kingsmore Stadium, a 3-1 Clemson lead as we head to the bottom of the fifth inning and a new pitcher, a left-hander for the first time today, Beth Clark. Good-looking lefty, 6'3", 220 from Loganville, Georgia. And the number's pretty inflated in a small sample size so far this year. Seven innings, and you see the walks and strikeouts have been a, a bit of an issue, not... Uh, not the strikeouts per se, but eight walks uh, a little bit too high for his liking, I would say. An opponent's hitting a robust 387 against Seth Clark. Giving up two home runs, three doubles, and a triple. Well, what's funny is you might say, well, you're bringing in a lefty to face. Right. Two of the next three are Parker and Hackenberg, and then you got French Hawkins at Tito. So they're all right handed. But the one lefty is Cade Grice. Yeah. And for that reason, I don't mind this strategic move whatsoever. Swing and a miss. He's going to locate there. It's going to be a long night for the right-handers. 84 down and away. James Parker's 0 for 2 tonight. Put them both in play. Pop out to short and a fly out to left. That ball's ripped to left field, a base hit. I think he tried to throw the same pitch twice, and Parker didn't let him get away with it. Good poke out to left field for James. His first hit. Parker had a six-game hitting streak snapped on Sunday, so that'll get another one going for him. And now it's Caden Grice. First pitch to him. Good breaking ball for a strike. He's seen a lot of off-speed pitches in this game. That apparently the strategy for the Georgia State pitchers against Grice. That was just 75 miles an hour. Strike two on the inside corner. I wouldn't throw him a fastball. No, I wouldn't either. Especially with somebody on base. If he's going to beat me out of the ballpark, it's going to be on a solo home run. 0-2, and he swung on a pitch in the dirt and can't advance. That's a big out for Clark, and he did it. Well, I guess he made it look easy. Good pitch call there on 0-2. Bounced it up there. Now Hackenberg, who was hit by a pitch and scored a run back in the fourth. He is 0 for 1 today in his season debut. Coming back from an injury that cost him the first few weeks of the season. A little tapper foul there, 0 and 1. Talked a lot about the leadership of Hackenberg. Tim, you mentioned in the open that Adam won the award for the best leadership in 2020, and he was named one of the co-captains of this team. And one of the issues for this team at 
five and eight is that the captain hasn't been out there on the field right for a very young team throw over to first It'd be like if you said Amir Sims couldn't play on the basketball team that's right Kind of guy that willingly takes on a leadership role. This ball's hit in the air to right. Can of corn for Pearson. Two out. Amir, by the way, made second team all district today by the Basketball Writers Association and the Coaches Association, NABC. Well deserved. Yep. We know he's got one more career game. He'd be fine with me if he played a few more times. Yep. He started on the Sweet 16 team his freshman year. Swung on and missed that time by French. Jonathan French, two for two. Had a solo home run in the second that started the scoring. He singled back in the fourth and scored again in the item of note in both of those was that each of his two hits were to the opposite field. That's a good pitch to his back foot for strike two. Worth another look. Clark gave up the leadoff single. Kind of looked like we were going to see more of his stat line. He's come back now and he's still Ahead 0-2 to French. He's thrown nothing but strikes in this inning so far. Ten pitches, all strikes. Long look in. He's got his sign. A big 0-2 pitch coming. Off the end of the bat, left center field, a long run, and on the move, the catch made by Smith. And the inning is over. So Georgia State goes to the bullpen. Seth Clark strands one hit in the inning. It's 3-1 Tigers to the sixth. 3-1 the score. Sometimes when it rains, the grounds crew works overtime, and they're doing their daily duty here between the fifth and the sixth innings. I do want to mention, uh, I got a tweet from Frank Gentry in regard to my uh, talking about Dick Dietz. He hit by a pitch and they called him back in the game against the uh, Dodgers in 68. Frank says, my grandmother taught Dick Dietz in high school at Greenville High School. He used to store his baseball gear in her classroom during the day. How about that? <laughs> Try to story from Dick Frank. Dietz was from, uh, <laughs> was from uh, Greenville. There's a look at Mike Eccles. Best in the business right there. This grounds crew, they do. He's got his boots on. He does. He was prepared for it to rain the whole yeah, day. Absolutely. They do a great job. This field's in great shape. I mean, it basically rained all day. Love the tiger paws we had on the bases. Blankets everywhere. You got to love the economy there. Four people, two blankets. That's good. A little bit wet. A few folks still here at the ballpark enjoying some baseball. A little chilly. Boy, it felt like spring here last week and seems like winter has returned with a vengeance the last couple of days. So I do have to pass along one story about the worst weather ever for a Clemson baseball game. All right. Before I came to Clemson, it was in the 19, early 1970s, and this story was told to me by Bob Bradley. We got Will Mize up at the plate. Mize a sack fly his last time up. Drove in the only run for Georgia State. He takes ball one from Pandia. So it was a key series at the end of the season. It was on a Saturday night. And, you know, we didn't have all the weather radar stuff that we do today. Big swing and a miss. Counts even a ball and a strike. But everybody could tell the game was on the road. It wasn't at Clemson. I want to say it was in Raleigh. 
And so the weather looked really bad, and so the commissioner actually called the press box to see if they were going to finish the game because it was a key game in the standings. And Mr. Bradley answered the phone, and right about that time, a bolt of lightning hit the right field foul pole. Mr. B said you could see the lightning go all the way around to the left field foul pole. <laughs> and Mr. B said, when the commissioner asked him, he said, well, I'm not sure, but I think we're going to have a decision very quickly. <laughs> and after the game, when they went to the bus, Mr. B went out to the, to the right field foul pole, and he said the lightning had soldered the gate latch to the gate. Holy smokes. There's a little looper out to right field, a base hit for Mize. First time he's on base today. This is what a good hitter does, a pitcher's pitch right here. 2-2, two, two, just poke it out to right field. The old hit them where they ain't. He's one for two now, came in hitting 371. He hit 373 three last year. So how long did it take him to replace that gate? I, I, I don't know. Like I said, it was a road game. So Mr. B didn't hang around to find out. <laughs> <laughs> There's a strike call to, to say the least. Fuck it. The game was called after that. <laughs> now, fortunately, it was during the innings. There were not players on the field when that happened. Players were in the dugout. That's pretty scary stuff. Yeah, I know. But when you think about it, I mean, even the major league levels in the th in the 30s, when they all played afternoon games in the middle of the summer, they had to be lots of times where you didn't see the lightning or, or you didn't have, you know, the chance to get out of harm's way until you saw it. It was a foul back one and two. There's nothing like a lightning storm in a baseball game. Went out to Omaha in 2010 and sat through a lightning delay because we didn't dare come down from the perch at Old Rosenblatt yeah. during a lightning storm, and it was beautiful. Didn't play any more baseball that day, but it was beautiful. There's a swing and a miss, a strikeout, and almost got Mize on the snap throw. Pretty good gun there by French to Grice. Here's the first part of that, the swing and a miss. And now part two, and almost. Seventh strikeout for Clemson pitching. Pretty good play by Mize to go to the back corner of the bag with his left hand. If he goes to the front of the bag, he's out. Pandia crossed up his catcher that time, it looked like. Did they call it a strike? Well, the, I thought he... I don't think he signaled the strike. No, he did signal a strike, 0-1. That was a weird pitch. You could hear the Panthers dugout asking, what was it? But down and away. That's a pitch the home plate umpire has been calling a strike much of the day. Yes. Elian Marejo, strikeout and a tapper that the catcher field didn't throw him out. Strike two. Now, as you said, Tim, that has been a strike. Here's another look at it. That's been a strike today. It might be off the plate, but it's been a strike today. It just wasn't the last pitch. Right. One, two. Throw it again. Strike three swinging back-to-back -back punch outs for Pandia. Since Mize got to first base. He took a little off of that, too. That was a great pitch. Eighth strikeout for Clemson pitching. Pandia, not a big strikeout guy, as we talked about. He yeah. works best backwards. Letting that breaking ball establish things and then coming back with a fastball. Big swing and a miss. Not much but breaking balls here, and Josh Smith has struck out looking the last two times up. 
Smith has two home runs, one of three players on the Georgia State team with two homers. Strike two called on the outside corner. Pandia way ahead. Balls and two strikes. That one bounces and the runner's gone. He'll take second base. He was halfway to second base. They're going to call it a wild pitch, but he was. <laughs> I guess he wasn't stealing, but. He was way out. Let's yeah, take another yeah. look. Oh, he had a huge secondary lead there. Probably right to score a wild pitch, but you're right, Tim. He was way off of first base yeah. when that ball hit the dirt. Just up high. Two and two. Not by much. It missed, though. One, two. Looper to right field. That's going to fall in for a hit, and it's going to split the outfield. Smith heading to second. He's going to stop right there. And how about an RBI double on a ball that he missed the barrel on? Ended up splitting the gap and driving in a run. It's now 3-2 Tigers as the Panthers have pulled within a run. Yeah, I didn't think the ball was going to be hit that hard to get out there. The exit speed was just 89 miles an hour. But it fell in the gap. And we've got a 3-2 baseball game. Nice job there by Smith. Pick up an RBI on the extra base hit. And Mize probably scores without it, but the wild pitch becomes at least a little bit significant for yeah. his effort level. Yep. Here's Griffin Chaney. Skips up there, 1-0. He was just moving along and struck out two batters. Prior to that double by Smith. Pitch to Chaney. Out in the dirt, and oh, French had him dead to rights. He tried to advance on the wild pitch and then lost the ball. Trying to get it into his throwing hand. Aggressive base running by Smith. Look at this. He's off. I mean, French has him yeah. by half the baseline there. That go down is another wild pitch. Pandia deals a strike, two and one. Now the tying run all of a sudden for the Panthers is 90 feet away. Two wild pitches in the inning, two for Pandia. Chained the batter, has only three RBIs all year. Boom, a fastball right there, backed up into the strike zone, two and two. Tigers came in in 116 innings, having thrown just seven wild pitches. Pandia's thrown two in this inning. 2-2 two -two pitch. Hit in the air, left center field. Tracking at Teodosio, it's carrying well, and he slams into the wall and made the catch. Oh. What a play by Bryce Teodosio. He climbed the terrace and stole extra bases as he crashes into the wall. Georgia State pulls within a run, three to two, but the Tigers stole extra bases. Here's Bryce Teodosio. He crashes into the wall, making a catch out in center field. You see him disappear, and how about that? The rainwater coming off the linked fence behind that Prisma Health banner. That's a heck of a play by Teodosio in the left center field gap. And he will bat next after Breyer Hawkins here. There's a strike call to Breyer. Owen won the count 0 for 2 today. Ball is carrying well. Normally here at Doug Kingsmore Stadium, the wind's knocking the ball down. We saw two balls that seemed like they were going to hang up and be caught in the gaps. Carry well. First it was the... Double. They ended up driving in the run by Smith, and then 
Cheney's fly out. Both of those balls carried to the warning track. Hawkins now down in the count one and two. Pitch to Hawkins, bounces up there. The count's even at two and two. Tigers looking for some insurance here. Up a run, and Hawkins, he spit on a breaking ball that time. No go, says John Mary down at first base. And now the lefty, Clark. The big pitch coming up against a leadoff batter here in the sixth. Way outside, ball four. And Hawkins works his way on the bases for the first time today. So the Tigers up 3-2, and now Bryce Teodosio, who has historically hammered left-handed pitching, is up at the plate after making that fantastic catch out in left center field to end the top of the sixth. He should have let off. Usually, <laughs> make a great play, you lead off the next inning. That's true. Historically, I don't know why that is, but it is. Pitch misses away. 1-0 those baseball things. Was it Kenny Mayne that used to say? How many times do we see the highlight where the guy makes a great catch and then the next inning does something great at the plate? Yep. One of the old sports center anchors used to make a big deal about that. He tapped it right off the catcher. One and one. Of course, when you cut the highlights, you can make it say whatever you want. Tigers have gotten the leadoff man aboard three times today. Happened in the first, he was stranded. Happened in the fourth, he scored. Actually happened in the fifth as well. So this is the fourth time in six innings. I stand corrected. Two and one the count now to Teodosio. Pretty good sized lead over at first by Hawkins. And Teodosio takes strike two. Good pitch there from Clark right on the inside corner. And a sneaky fast. The ball is hammered to left center field. Backing the center fielder, Rieselman. He will not get it. And there is the big hit we were looking for from Bryce Teodosio. He saves a run in center field and plates two with a homer. And it's 5-2 Tigers here in the sixth. His second home run of the year and 15th of his career, which leads all active Clemson players. Second home run of the day for the Tigers. French had one earlier. Ordinarily, you're not sure if that ball is going to get out or not, but the way we've seen the ball carry, there was really no doubt off the bat that time. Yeah, it is interesting that in the, with the high humidity with the weather, although the wind is not blowing either way, uh, that the ball is kind of carrying today. Here, Meredith takes ball one outside. So the Tigers come right back with a two spot after, right after Georgia State cut it to one. That's big. A little bit outside, 2-0. Oh. Tigers now with five runs on five hits. And now time called. And this may be a pitching change, and it will be. Once again to the bullpen. Go the Panthers and Brad Stromdahl 
Brings a hook with him to get Clark. We'll take a break. We'll come back in a moment tell you about the new pitcher. Jet Kern, the fifth pitcher of the day for Georgia State. Tigers up 5-2 and 5'11", 180-pound sophomore from Roswell, Georgia, trying to keep it right there. Again, we know some of these small sample size ERAs a little bit bloated, six innings. He's got a 12 ERA with three walks and five strikeouts, making his fourth appearance here tonight. Comes in for Clark, who went one inning, gave up two hits, two runs, two earned, one walk and a strikeout, and of course gave up. He was sailing along there, and Dinocio knocked it out of the park. And we knew that both these teams had a chance to use a lot of pitchers tonight. Every time you throw guys who haven't made a start yet, you're going to have a little bit of a quick trigger, especially early in the year. And both head coaches have. This will be the fifth pitcher for the Panthers. And Tigers have had three in their own right so far. And we've not completed the sixth inning yet. And a tough spot now for Kern coming in with a 2-0 count. He's got to throw a strike right now. And he does. Coming into this game, Georgia State had 76 pitching appearances in 17 games. So... That's what, four and a half pitchers a game. Four and a half a game. Meredith hits one in the air to center. Everybody in a great jersey converges and nobody makes the play. I mean, you got five guys out there and nobody made the play on the ball. It was a total convention out there. One, two, three, four. Did anybody call it? I don't think so. There were four guys there. I mean, you heard a, you, or you didn't really hear anything, but you saw a couple of guys kind of shy away like somebody else called it. Nobody really made a play on it. Kier Meredith will gladly take the extra base hit. Yep. He's now gotten on base four times. That's what you want your leadoff guy to do. He needed a game like this after going one for 12 in Chapel Hill last weekend. Yes, indeed. Elijah Henderson, fielder's choice RBI's last time up. He squares to Bunt and bunts it well down to third. He's going to try to make it for a hit, and the throw gets away. Coming home, Meredith. He's going to score on the error. And it's now 6-2 Tigers as they play a little small ball at the top of the order. He is sacrificed in an error on the throw by the third baseman. Very well done by yeah, Henderson perfect, perfect here. But he would have been out at first with a good throw, though. So for the second time up, Henderson able to put the ball in play, allowing a runner to score. He won't get credit for this one. But he will get to run at first base with Dylan Brewer at the plate. He's 0 for 2 with a walk and two strikeouts. Still nobody out. There's a strike. That's got to frustrate you as a pitcher and as a coaching staff. Runner going, balls hit. Off the glove to the bag, the first baseman makes the play. That was a rocket right at Marejo, and Henderson can't believe it. I know Meredith just saw one fall in, but Clemson's got to feel like they're snake bit a little bit right now. How in the world did that not get down the line? He dives back in with both hands. Fine play by the first baseman. It goes as a three unassisted in the box score, and the Book of stats, but. What a play to just knock it down. Yeah. Right down the chalk. Throw over to second. Dives back. 
Now runner in scoring position. As Brewers ground ball does advance the runner. James Parker, one for three with a single. Ground ball to third and by the third baseman. Parker winds around first. He'll stop right there. Boy, that was a tough play because Puckett tried to pick it on an in-between hop, and it really messed him up. Take a look at this. Really tough play. Yeah, you had to dive over it. Plus, it was kind of the in-between hop on top of that. That's going to be a single, and that is the first hit of the game for the Tigers with runners in scoring position. Now one for seven on the evening. Caden Grice a chance to make it two for eight. Here's a first pitch to Grice, a breaking ball strike. Seven hits now for the Tigers. It's already the most runs Clemson has scored in the last seven games. I would imagine they're not really satisfied with six at this point. No. Tigers did have nine hits during the losing streak and a 12-2 to two loss to Upstate. That was a week ago. That's another game that got out of hand in a hurry. Ball has hit a mile in the air. That's going to get the run home probably. Smith makes the catch. The throw is going to come to second. It's actually going to chase the runner back. The throw there and sliding back is Parker. So that'll be a sack fly to left field. For the second out, Grice drives a run in. Henderson scores, and it's 7-2. to two. Just got a little bit under it. All right, now the umpires are coming together, and they're – Asking if maybe the runner at third, Henderson, left early. Appears they will have a split screen, simultaneous split screen to uh, view, but it looked like the Clemson runner did not leave too early. Now let's, let's see. We are going to have a review here, and we have access to everything that they see. Let's see, this is obviously something that they can look at. It didn't look untoward from this vantage point here. Once they get back there, we'll be able to look at it. They're going to look at first. See if Parker got back. That's what they're looking at? That's what they looked at the play at first? Hmm. Oh, my word. Okay. Well, there we go. Safe. The easiest call in the history of replay review. Man, that's two minutes of life we'll never get back. I don't think it took two minutes. No. <laughs> You're right. I gave him credit for the huddle into the dugout see, back okay, out. Yeah. <laughs> It was 15 seconds of review. He's safe by three steps. What are we doing? Two outs. Runner at first. He's up Hackenberg. He's been hit by a pitch and scored and a couple of fly outs to right field. First pitch from Kern is taken up and in. Ball one. Sophomore from Palmyra, Virginia. Downstairs, ball two. We talk a lot about his brother playing football, but his father also played football at the University of Virginia. I assume he played against Clemson. 
I would think so. Especially back in those days, you can yeah. pretty much confirm it. 2 0 pitch, fouled straight back. Up and out of play. Back in the days when Clemson had a 29 game winning streak against Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was growing up, it was a cardinal sin to lose to Virginia, and I didn't figure out why. Runner going there as the ball got away from the catcher, and Parker is going to advance to second. That's a wild pitch. Easily in there, Parker. Virginia ended that streak 20 to 7 in 1990. Virginia went on to have a great year that year. One of the oddities about that series, Clemson's first win in the series was by the same score, 20 to 7. How about that? Three balls and a strike to count to Hackenberg, and he hits one high in the air back in the left field. That's going to carry. And be caught just shy of the 360 sign. Bryce Teodosio hit it a little bit farther. This is what he did to extend the Tigers' lead out to left center field. Well, a back and forth game as Clemson and Georgia State battled until right there in the bottom of the six, that four in the line score has extended Clemson's lead to seven to two. As we head to the latter third of the ball game here at Doug Kingsmore Stadium. New third baseman for the Tigers, Max Starbuck. He was the opening day starter at second base last year and has appeared in one game so far, has yet to come to the plate. He is due up first. Or excuse me, he's due up second in the bottom of the seventh. And quickly, Pandy is ahead of Ashby Smith. He wrote the double over the third baseman's head back in the fifth inning. One for two today. Check swing. Did not go around. John Mary said nope. Smith struck out in the third after a lengthy at bat and then doubled. He's had two good appearances so far. I think we're both pretty impressed with him. Two and two count on the ball in the dirt. Bottom of the order. Set to face Pandia here. Pitch. A little way. He came in to face the leadoff hitter Pearson. Got a fly out. Face five batters in the sixth. Now the seventh batter he'll face right here, and he just lost that breaking ball. And Smith takes a walk to get aboard for the second time. Third walk by Clemson pitching, first since the third inning. Now Rieselman. 0 for 1 today, walked and scored in the third inning on a sack fly. Kind of went around station to station. Georgia State needs a big inning here offensively, and it's a team that hasn't gotten nearly enough scoring in recent games. And their seven-game losing skid. To, here's a strike call. Panthers scored one, one, zero, one, 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 two. And before that, they had scored double figures twice, including a 10-1 win at Georgia Tech on March the 3rd, just 13 days ago. That ball gets away from French. And down to second goes Smith. That's going to go in the book as a pass ball. We didn't have any wild pitches or pass balls. First five innings, and now... Got all kind of them. Get one, find a gap. Get one, find a gap. Let's go. Come on, come on. 
Well, nobody out and a runner at second. And again, if it were 3 2, Rieselman's job will be easy here. 7 2, he's probably got to swing away, and he does, and he misses. He really blew it by him that time. I'd come back with the same fastball. I don't disagree. Smith leads his second. There you see him at the bottom of your screen. Ground ball right side. He does get him over. Henderson throws to first to get the out. Smith now standing at third. Rieselman did the least he could do. Move the runner over, and now it's... Blaine Marchman's job to get him in. Now time called as Andrew C is going to come out to the mound. And the Tigers are going to make another pitching change. We'll tell you about Clemson's new arm here in just a second. Tigers up 7-2 here in the seventh. New reliever coming in. New pitcher for Andrew C. and Monty Lee is Nick Clayton. 6'5 freshman from York. South Carolina, big, strong right-handed arm. He's One walk, seven strikeouts. Fourth appearance of the year. He got the win against East Tennessee State on March the 2nd. Had five strikeouts and no walks in that game. For the year, he's got seven strikeouts and one walk. Giving up just four hits and three earned runs. Last year as a freshman, he was 1-0 and with the win coming over. Stony Brook also had a save against Liberty. He pitched eight and two thirds innings. Wow, just one unearned run on three hits with four walks. Pretty good start to his Clemson career and then struggled a bit out of the gate this year, but a lot of talent. That young man right there, ball one misses inside to Marchman. He's got a strand of man at third with less than two outs, and the job again for Marchman is simple. Get him in. Squares to Bunt and fouled it. One and one the count. Little safety squeeze chance there for the Panthers. Missed the opportunity in a no strike count. And we'll see what they come back with in a one strike count. Ripped on the ground, foul into the bullpen. Both coaching staffs have been pretty agreeable with putting guys in the middle of innings today. Almost all the pitching changes have come in the middle of innings, and almost all have come with guys on base. There's a one two, swing and a miss. Just waved at that one. Rush the fastball right by him, right at the top of the strike zone. And a big strikeout for Clayton coming right into the ball game. Eighth strikeout for Clemson pitching. Clemson's gone to relievers three times. Twice they've gone to relievers with two outs. Here with one out. First batter, all three of face, has been retired. Here's Pearson. Strike one. 0 for 2, a couple of flyouts and a walk for Pearson. That's a good pitch down in the zone from Clayton. Like a little changeup, 85, 0 and 2. Runner Smith leads it third. Clayton looking for a punch out to keep him right there. He gets it. Strike three called on the outside corner. Nick Clayton comes in and does the job and strands a runner. One more look at strike three. Time to stretch here in Clemson. You count the Ks, that's 10. Up on the outfield fence. Of Georgia State batters. Nick Clayton just got two of them. 
right into the game. And right now the Panthers going to the bullpen. And they're going to bring on a freshman left-hander, a guy that's gotten a good bit of work here early in the season. Brandon Haston. Haston, I believe is how you say that. Four and two-thirds innings of work already. He's making his seventh appearance at 9.64 ERA. A bundle of hits and walks against him. He will face the bottom third of the order. Brandon Haston. Jonathan French, he's been a hard guy to retire in this game. Two for three, solo home run, singled and scored, and then fly out to left field. Scored two runs also. First pitch from Haston, right in the inside corner, strike one. Pitch there. Got some defensive changes to tell you about at the corners and behind the play for Georgia State. Give you those in a second. 0-1 pitch, right in there, strike two. There's a look in at Haston. 0-2 pitch to French. A little bit down. Tigers up 7-2. Big four-run sixth inning. The real culprit for busting this thing wide open. One-two pitch way up and outside. Opponents hit just 167 against him last year. Two fifty this year. Aston trying to get his sign. Here's a two-two pitch. Swing and a miss. French tried to get inside that ball, and it was easier said than done for the first down of the look at it. Yeah, good pitch. 88 miles per hour. Brings up Max Starbuck. First plate appearance of the year. The freshman from Easley. First pitch to him, taken upstairs. One of the things you like about Starbuck, he is a difficult strike zone to hit. Tigers have a couple of those. Starbuck, Reagan Reed is another one. Swinging a tip into the mitt that time. One and one. We mentioned that Starbuck was the Opening day starter at second base. Started a handful of games last year at second. Played off and on at the Keystone. One, one pitch. Fouled away, one and two. Haston looks like he's got a pitch that kind of jams the right-hand hitters. He's unafraid to bring it in on their hands. Yeah. Starbuck took a little bit of extra time out of the box after the foul ball. Here's Haston's one-two. Way up and away, two and two. Three changes for... Georgia State, Branson Bowling in the game at third, Ryan Glass in the game at first, and Tanner Gallman, you see right there behind the plate. And all three of those changes at the half inning. Starbuck down swinging. God, it's been tough to get out. In fact, they haven't done it yet. Bryce Teodosio, here's what he did 
in the field in the top of the sixth inning, robbing extra bases. And then Timmy went yard out to left center field to give the Tigers a 5-2 lead. Yeah, he had a nice game in the sixth inning, didn't he? <laughs> when the Tigers offensively and defensively knocked that ball uh, out of the park. 392 feet, the measurement. The two home runs for Clemson are 397 by French and 392 by Teodosio. And the launch angle, a little more of a fly ball from Bryce than the line drive we saw from French. And Teodosio technically one for one today. It's hit by pitch, stole a base in the second, walked in the fourth, and hit the two run home run back in the sixth. Swing and a miss, one and one. You see that average up to 303. Yeah, good to see. I think he was, what, three for 18 last year? Really struggled out of the gate. Two years ago, he was hot. Yeah. Right from the jump for about a month and then really cooled off after that. He's been known as a streaky hitter, but we talked about a little bit earlier, his approach at the plate has been such here in the early going that it seems like something that he could carry on. It's not like he's seen a bunch of fastballs right now and once the Tigers get an ACC play, teams are just going to throw him a lot of junk. He's hitting just about everything right now. Takes that one up high, two and two. And also, and we've talked about this several times, Bryce Teodosio would swing at a lot of pitches in previous years that he's taking right now, like that pitch would have been a strikeout pitch last year. 2-2. Ball's hit in the air to right. And a carry to the warning track for Pearson. He makes the catch. A 1-2-3 inning for the Tigers offensively in the seventh. Still leading 7-2. We head to the eighth. Look at Clemson's upcoming schedule here. Back in the ACC this weekend here at home. They'll go to North Augusta. Take on Georgia Southern in a midweek clash a week from tonight. On the road for a couple ACC series, sandwiched around a big game with Georgia at the end of the month in March. As we said, it doesn't get any easier. That's why Monty Lee really wanted to play this game tonight, and rightfully so. And it's also why the Panthers wanted to play this game tonight. Try to right the ship and figure some things out before they in her sunbelt play. Swing and a miss there on the first pitch dealt to Will Mize. That, uh, the last series on that graphic was Clemson's three-game series at NC State. Check swing, and he did go around. 0-2. One of the oddest stats, accomplishments, whatever you want to call it. I guess he went around. In Clemson history, 14 times a Clemson player has hit three home runs in a game. Three of the 14 have taken place at NC State's home ballpark. Really? It's happened only three times here in this <laughs> ballpark. So as many, there's been as many three homer games in Raleigh as there have yeah, from Clemson. Those were by Neil Simons in 1979 in the infamous 41-9 Clemson game in which the Tigers scored 18 runs in the top of the ninth inning. <laughs> Shane Monahan hit three in 1993 at NC State. And Taylor Harbin did it in 2005. I would have guessed that all three would have been lefties. Ball really flies out of there to right field. I guess it flies out of there to left field, too. Simons it was, and Shane Monahan was. Taylor was right. Harbin was not. That's right. Time called at the plate now. Mize do a 1-2 pitch here to lead off the top of the eighth. Nick Clayton back on the hill. Got a couple strikeouts to end the seventh. Swing and a miss. Come on, Geek. Nasty pitch down and away from Clayton to put away Mize here. Got him to go fishing. Yeah, for whatever the reason, Clemson has played some bizarre games. <clears> that <throat> 79 game against uh, 
NC State. <laughs> you know, in those days, Mr. Bradley would call back to the office and dictate the box score, dictate everything. I mean, that's just the way it was, you know, done. And so I, you know, was waiting and waiting and waiting, and I'd call up there. When the game was going to the ninth inning, so I had an idea when to come in the office because I would do it from the office and type it up and then send it out in the telecopy. Six minutes per page. It's <laughs> <laughs> brutal. It was brutal. Um, so anyway, it just kept going. And, I'm, and so, you know, I didn't have a cell phone. Really, so, But then uh, when he finally called me, he says, well, you're not going to believe what happened. <laughs> I believe Robert Bonnet had three hits in that inning. As I said, we scored 18 runs when we had already scored uh, 23 going into the inning. I don't even know what to do with that information. Like 20, you scored 23 runs and you're not done. And you're not so done. not done. And the other team is so incapable of stopping you. So then in the same ballpark in 1995 was the greatest comeback in yes. history at NC State. 2-1, a swing and a miss, 2-2. Two and two. This will teach you to leave a game early right here. Clemson trailed 15-4 to four going into the top of the ninth. And then scored exactly 11 runs to send it to the bottom of the ninth at 15-15, and we held him. I mean, you figure if you're going to score 11, why not just score 12 to take the lead? But no, Ed scored exactly 11. And so Clemson won the game 17-15. to And so uh, the next morning, Ray Tanner, who was then the baseball coach at NC State, he went out to get his morning paper and his <laughs> three two pitch. There's a swing and a miss. And his next door neighbor came up to him, was also out to get his paper, and he said, Coach, that was a great game last night. It was a great, great win over Clemson. And Ray Tanner said to his neighbor, he says, well, How long did you stay? Oh, we left in the top of the ninth inning. You were up by 11 runs. And he, <laughs> Of course, embarrassingly, I had to tell them that they had lost. <laughs> Again, brutal. Poor guy. He's just trying to compliment the coach. That's right. He's trying to be a friendly neighbor. This is Brandon Bowling. The last at bat was Ryan Glass, the first baseman, who came in for Puckett at third. And this is the new third baseman, Bowling. Batting 095, who came in for the first baseman, Marejo. Swing and a miss, 0-2. So Clayton has struck out all four men he has faced, correct? He has. Rather impressive. Chance to make it five in a row. 0-2 pitch. This is outside. Ball one. You know, that's a record I don't think we have in the baseball guide. Consecutive strikeouts by a Clemson pitcher. I don't uh, I don't remember. You think that in the modern era, anything more than about four or five. Yeah. It's gonna probably that's probably gonna be the max. Pitch misses away, two and two. Because at the very least, if you got that good of stuff, you're going to walk somebody. Yeah. Seven two, the score in the top of the eighth. Nick Clayton one strike away from another one two three inning. This would be five straight punch outs if he could get bowling here. He does. Nick Clayton strikes out the side in order. Five batters faced. Five strikeouts for the big right hander. Tigers coming to bat in the bottom of the eighth with a five-run lead. This game was 3-2 in the bottom of the sixth. It's now 7-2 because the Tigers blew it open. First, Bryce Teodosio played long ball, and then Elijah Henderson played a little small ball. The ball got away. Kier Meredith scored, and then Caden Grice with a sacrifice fly. Drove in the fourth and final run of the sixth inning. Tigers really needed an inning like that, Tim, as you see Henderson crossing the plate. They hadn't had an inning like that in a while. 
Yeah, I guess it's the uh, Friday Notre Dame game, I believe, that they've scored four runs in an inning. So that was uh, something they needed. Good to see. Dawson Sweat, sophomore. All right, just a hair north of four. Eight walks to six strikeouts in six and two-thirds innings for the left-hander. He will face the top of the order for the Tigers here. Haston, uh, freshman, pitched really well, which one inning and faced three guys, got two strikeouts. Tigers do have a pinch hitter who has just checked into the ball game. I would concur about Haston. He's out pretty good, yeah. Here's Reagan Reed. Pinch hitting at the top of the order for Clemson. Reed batting 316 for RBI. This is seventh appearance, only a second off the bench. He's six for 19 with three walks and six strikeouts. Been used primarily at second base. Couple of stints as a DH. This ball hit down the line. A long run. The right fielder slams into the wall on a slide. Pearson like a cannon. Look at this effort here on the foul ball. And a five-run game. Not leaving anything out there. Yeah. Reed comes in for uh, Keir Meredith, who got on base all four times. He came to the plate two for two, hit by a pitch and a walk. Drove in a run. Pitch to Reed. A little bit high. Talked about this with Starbuck. Can be a difficult strike zone to hit. Reed listed at five foot seven. Teammate of shortstop James Parker at T.O. Hanna High School. He pops that one up. Right side. Pearson's coming in. He'll catch it. A little easier for Pearson that time. A little bit. You work hard enough on the hard ones, the easy ones are easier. I think that's how that's supposed to work. <laughs> right, here's Elijah Henderson. He reached on an E5 on a sacrifice. What was a successful sacrifice bunt back in the sixth inning? He also drove in a run the fourth with the fielder's choice ground out up the middle. First pitch to him. Tap foul. Kind of a change up curve with 79 miles an hour. Pretty good pitch by Sweat. He's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh pitcher for Georgia State. And as you would expect, not a ton of power arms as Henderson got something in his eye there. Might have been some residue from that mustache. <laughs> He's okay. Hopefully so. This is the first meeting between Clemson and Georgia State in baseball, which is kind of surprising when you think they're just down the road. I know Georgia State, they had a program in the 60s, which was not, not much more than an intramural program, but then they brought it back, I guess, in the 80s. But you just think we would have played before now. We played them in football and basketball, and I think soccer. Yeah, this seemed a little odd. 1-1 one, one pitch from Sweat to Henderson. Up and away. We actually opened the 1986-87 uh, yeah, season in basketball against them at Little John Coliseum, Horace Grant's senior year. So like, as I remember, he had a huge game. He had mostly huge games. Yes, he did. That ball a shot foul up and out of play right side, two and two. You know, his senior year, I look out in the left field and they have the K's up for strikeouts. The students used to put up R's 
for his rebounds. <laughs> and uh, his last senior game, I think he had 20 rebounds. They just, I almost ran out of R's. I'm shocked they didn't run out of R's at 20. They had Actually, more than 20? Yeah, he had 20. Wow. 2 2 pitch to Henderson. Popped him straight up. That's going to drift foul back and out of play. Henderson working that 2 2 count against Sweat, the lefty. The Tigers up five runs here in the eighth. Here's the pitch. Slow tapper to third, charging, can't get it out of the glove. Third baseman bowling, couldn't convert it from the glove hand to the throwing hand, and Henderson credited with an infield single. Good hustle here. Yep, slow roller. Another good, actually, was another good, kind of good pitch. Change up curve by the uh, pitcher, and Henderson beats it out. That's the eighth hit of the game. For the Tigers, two homers, a double, and five singles. On Dylan Brewer, 0 for 3 today. Ripped the ball down the line that Moreo knocked down. Was able to go hands first into the bag to force him out. Really good defensive play, robbed him of extra bases. First three times he walked and struck out twice. Long look in, get the sign from the lefty. Bouncer, right side of the infield. The only play for Cheney will be to first. Two away in the inning. Well, that was right off the end of the bat from Brewer. Henderson advances to second now for James Parker. A couple of hits for James tonight. Got a two for four going. Raises his average to th from 343 to 357. Batting 267 with runners in scoring position this year. 278 with two outs. Pitch down in the dirt. Henderson ready to go. It got away, but it did not from the catcher, Gallman. Want to know the count. Tigers with that four-run sixth. Able to bust the game open. Otherwise, it'd be a one-run ball game, and everybody would be sweating every pitch at this point. Move it upstairs, 2-0. Strike zone squeezed a little bit since it stopped raining, Tim. I wonder if those two things are related. <laughs> Yeah, there were times earlier in the game, I thought our umpire thought the width of the home plate was 23 inches. <laughs> I'm not saying that was a strike, but I'm saying pitches beyond that were strikes in the first few innings. There's strike one. Don't blame James for taking that on 2-0. and Not much you could do with it. Fastball count here. So a good fastball hitter. Here comes Sweat. That was a breaking ball. He loops it to right field. Coming on and making the catch is the right fielder Pearson. And the side is retired. Georgia State with some work to do in the ninth. Coming up next. Clemson's pitching's been awfully good tonight, Tim. Racked up 13 strikeouts with four different pitchers. Yeah, the Tigers have been pretty good in strikeout to walk ratio all year, 4.25 to 1 coming into this game. And uh, 13 
strikeouts, including each of the last five batters by Clayton, who's going to remain in the game and see if he can uh, lengthen that streak. Yeah, you see Nick Clayton on the mound. Five up and five down, all via the strikeout. One defensive change for Clemson. Bo Mikowski in the game in left field. He's a guy that's played quite a bit the last couple of years, but making his season debut right now in the outfield for Clemson. The one is tipped into the mitt by Josh Smith. It counts 0-2. Smith is one for three. He doubled to the opposite field into the gap to drive in a run in the sixth. That made it a 3-2 game. Slow bouncer. Who's got it? It'll be third base. Good throw there. Across the diamond to get him out. Nice play by Starbuck. Now a pinch hitter for the Panthers. Number 11, Jonathan Ponder in the game. Six foot freshman from Lawrenceville, Georgia. Making his 11th appearance of the year. Two for 17 at the plate. Five walks and eight strikeouts. Which missed up and in ball one. Talk about the Clemson pitching. They've only given up four hits in the game also. It's been a good uh, performance. No question about it. There's a strike. Pitch down low. That was the first ball put in play off Clayton. That ground ball to third. Yeah, he's tied his career out for strikeouts in the game with five. He also had five earlier this year against East Tennessee State. There's a pop up right side. Brewer on the move, makes the grab in foul ground. What a catch by Dylan Brewer. Worth another look. The all out effort, slide stretches, makes the play. Tigers have not committed an error tonight. We've seen some nice play. Of course, Teodosio had a great play also. Clayton's going to come out. We're going to give somebody else a chance. Yeah, another call to the bullpen here for the final out of the ball game. Andrew C. bringing the hook with him with one out to go. We'll tell you about the new pitcher when we come back. Alex Edmondson, freshman from Simpsonville, into the game to get the final out for the Tigers, making his second appearance of the year. Two weeks ago, he made his first to get the final out of a win against East Tennessee State. A little bit high to Ashby Smith, ball one. What a performance by Nick Clayton today. I was going to say, he replaced Nick Clayton in that game, and in that game, Clayton had five strikeouts and no walks. Seems like pretty good synergy. Ashby Smith is one for two today with a double strikeout and a walk. He's had a good game so far for the Panthers. They will head back on the road, face ULM this weekend, and then mercifully they get to go home for the first time since February 24th. So they'll spend a full month on the road. But outside, three and one. Most deterring the best the SEC has to offer prior to this game. Vanderbilt, Tennessee, Florida, Kentucky. And 
They also did play Georgia Tech because there's a walk. Five pitch free pass issued to Smith by Edmondson. Now Kyle Rieselman will grab a bat. Center fielder 0 for 2 with a walk and a run scored. Edmondson trying to close it out. Big swing and a miss. 92 on the gun that time. You see his numbers. A little bit outside. Edmondson a hard thrower. Made a name for himself when he was a youngster pitching in the Little League World Series. Bouncer foul. Counts one and two. You wonder when you see those kids on ESPN, how many of them actually move on to go pro or get scholarships. He's one of them. Yeah. One two pitch, way outside. Good breaking ball, just didn't control it. Edmondson a strike away from ending it. Rieselman trying to stay alive. He cannot. Strike three, and the ball game is over. 14th strikeout for Clemson staff. Tigers win it 7-2. That stops a six-game losing skid. And Alex Edmondson climbed the ladder to get it done. This is a big win, Tim, for this Clemson team, trying to get things going in the right direction again with win number six on the season. Absolutely, and scoring seven runs. It was important that they scored some runs to kind of break out of a slump. Had eight hits in the game, hit a couple of home runs. Good all-around night for the Tigers, who also did not commit an error. Yeah, eight hits, including those couple of home runs. It was a good night in Clemson. We wondered earlier in the day if the rain would keep us away. It did not. We saw some good baseball. The four-run inning gave the Tigers a 7-2 win as they pulled away in the six. For Sanders Sullivan, our producer, and the great crew in Jervy, for my broadcast partner, Tim Bure, I'm William Quackenbush saying so long from Doug Kingsmore Stadium. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.